Hi, I'm Drew Hutchison. You're tuned to Local Bias. We come to you from 393 Main Street in Greenfield. And my guest today, a very special guest, is the new president of Greenfield Community College, Eve Solomon Fernandez. Yes. All right. So I wasn't sure if it was Solomon or Solomon or how? Well, it's French, so you would say Salomon. Salomon. Yeah. And you would say Fernandez. Fernandez. Yeah. Ah, so wow. it's the French and the Spanish. Ah. Mucho gusto. <laughs> right. Mucho gusto, well, welcome Drew. Welcome to the show. <laughs> So, um, so I, I was under the, for some reason I had read that you had gone to school in, somewhere in the south or something. I don't know where that came from. I don't know where that came from either. So I was misinformed and I didn't bother to double check. I didn't corroborate <laughs> my misunderstanding. So you're actually, you had grown up in the eastern Massachusetts. So this is not so bizarre yeah. for you to be here. Yeah, so um, no it isn't. Um, I am actually, I was born in Haiti. I came to Boston when I was 12, and I did my schooling in Boston. I went to Boston Latin School, and then I did a study abroad program at Oxford University while I was a student at UMass Boston. Fell in love with England, so I decided that for my master's degree, I would go to the London School of Economics, and then um, came back, worked a little bit, and I pursued my PhD at Boston College. So. How does that end up with you being the president of GCC? <laughs> because, I mean, that economics I, I'm fascinated by. Yeah. Um, especially this idea of supply side economics. Yes. I don't know that it's ever yes. been shown to work, but yes. that's another story. <laughs> um, but what drove you into academia or into an academic administration? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a passion for education and specifically working with the types of students that we work with um, in community college. And I would say that GCC is a wonderful com community um, in that regard because we have students who are very academically gifted um, at the college. And we also have students for whom um, the opportunities to really shine academically were not there when they were in high school right. or throughout their career. So they're able to come to GCC and really, really shine. So to have that diversity of academic um, uh, academic backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And a really. lot of different ages. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so at the community college, we have a range of experiences that really, um, our students' range of experiences and ages mirror the real world. Okay. So when you go into a job, for instance, you're not only encountering 22-year-olds, you're working with people across the age span, you're working with people who are veterans, you're working with people who are different um, gender identity, race, racial, ethnic, um, and there's a lot uh, of disabled students too. Absolutely, we have so the, the whole range, and that's what makes uh, GCC exciting and the community college realm a great place to work. So, now I know you have the adult programming or the evening programming. Mm -hmm. In fact, I saw a Facebook post of you dancing. Yes, yes. My wife and I did that before we got married because oh, we didn't want to make great. total fools of ourselves. I'll keep on doing it. Why stop? Well, now we're getting divorced. Oh, oh should I say that? Okay. <laughs> uh, but no, dancing's a great thing. But I had so much fun with that. And so it's not as if you have to say, oh, well, I'm too old to go to college or it's so expensive to go back to college. If you want to take one class, you can certainly you do can that. You can take one class, and those are relatively inexpensive. Exactly. And I'll say something to what you just said. I think, for me as a parent, I have two kids, I think about total cost of education. Um, so we offer great careers in the vocational technical um, realm. We also have great liberal arts call, uh, uh, programs. So when you look at GCC, it feels different. Mm -hmm. It feels like a small private liberal arts co college. Right. You look at our location, you look at the campus, you see how beautiful it is, you look at the range of programs that we offer. So a parent whose child is going to go into a more traditional academic program, I uh, normally encourage parents to think about the total cost of education. Mm -hmm. Massachusetts is a knowledge-driven innovation economy. Mm -hmm. So for your child, if he or she is not going into a high-demand vocational technical um, trade, for your child to be solidly middle class, you, they have to be, that child has to get a master's degree. 
to have that level of socio-economic uh, mobility and career mobility, they mm -hmm. will need a master's degree. So when you enter uh, the phase where you have to make a college decision, so to think about, do I really want to put uh, all of my um, eggs into just the un the, the, um, the undergraduate right. um, uh, basket. So thinking about, okay, if I think that a master's degree is definitely where my child will end up or get a doctorate degree, whatever it may be, thinking about the total cost of college at the beginning is mm -hmm. very helpful. And starting at GCC, you can transfer to any college, any university, not just in Massachusetts, but in the country. Well, I think that people's attitudes about community colleges have changed. I know when I graduated from Greenfield High School, um, if you went to GCC, somehow that was a lesser place to go than mm -hmm. going to UMass or going to an Ivy League college. And um, my daughter, who is brilliant, mm -hmm. of course she's my daughter, she has to be brilliant. <laughs> You're not biased or anything. Not, no. <laughs> um, she's 12 and she's already planning to go to GCC for two years because she doesn't want to spend so much money yeah. going to a four-year college when really what are you doing the first two years? You're right. getting your credits, you're getting your core credits out of the way and I, I mean I, I remember when I went to college I, I almost feel like I, I wait, in fact I know I wasted most of the opportunity because I wasn't mature enough yet to actually seriously understand the opportunity to learn that it presents. Um, so it sounds like your daughter is much more financially savvy than you are. Well, she's a lot more mature at her age than I was at her age. And, uh, there's, there's evidence she may be more mature than I am at my <laughs> age and presently, but we're not going to get into that. Um, but, but the thing is, is, I think that societally, how we view community colleges has, have changed. It's no longer like, oh, that's where the, those kids go. It's yeah. anyone should be proud of good. Right. There's certainly in certain programs. I know the art department. Oh, is we have a phenomenal art department. Right. Yes, we have a phenomenal art department. We have a great business department. We have a great liberal arts program in general. Um, I mean, I could. Our nursing department is right. phenomenal. Um, now, as far as your role as being president, when you come in and mm -hmm. you see, okay, well, we have all these different departments, mm -hmm. and some of them have different reputations, mm -hmm. but but they're all pretty well thought of, I believe. Mm -hmm. Well, you only have so many resources. Mm -hmm. How do you determine how to allocate those resources? Because mm -hmm. there's sometimes there's the idea of, oh, well, why does anyone need a, a liberal arts education? Mm -hmm. Where's the, like, I, I'm a, I have a green English. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, what jobs are there in English? Well, I'm fluent. Yeah. And, it, and it's worked out, I think, okay for me. I'm glad that's what I did. But um, there's this tension between education for the sake of being able to reason, yeah. being able to discern facts from Fibs, mm -hmm. um, being a member of a society that has a commonality. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's what a liberal arts is—is mm -hmm. is that we're able to read literature and understand it, mm -hmm. or we're able to read read something and and, under, and see that oh, that's a logical fallacy. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're going into some applied uh, technical area, you may gain great skill on Excel or whatever it is, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that that makes you a better member of society. Mm -hmm. And yet, you can only allocate so much resources to each of those. So how do you determine that? What do you bring mm -hmm. that change, you know, how are you changing the vision of GCC mm -hmm. or are you changing the vision mm -hmm. of GCC? So there are parts of who we are and what we do that are excellent and we, would, we don't want to change that. And there are things that are sacred that really don't change with time. So the liberal arts degrees and the purpose of a higher education remains the purpose of higher education. Um, and of course, if students have a technical area in which they'd like to become prepared, um, we look at that also. So for us, it's about looking at some of those skills that are really immutable, that will never change over time. So the ability to read, write, communicate, um, uh, the ability to problem solve, to work with others, um, the ability to lead, the ability to collaborate, the ability to work across cultures, those are all skills that and knowledge mm -hmm. um, that one gets in the liberal arts. And there's also a lot of value in studying the liberal arts. My undergraduate degree was in political science. What do you do with that? Right. Um, so we look at that and we also look at the STEM areas that are growing significantly. What do our students want to do? Um, what do they do after? And looking at degrees that are for the purpose of 
um, transfer and also degrees that are more terminal degrees. So of course we look at things in their totality and we also look at them relative to the market. Is there a market demand for those skills once students graduate uh, for them to be able to get employed? Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of how we make decisions. Right. Um, I wouldn't recommend any drastic change in how um, we have made those decisions at GCC. I would say that my predecessors have done a really fabulous job in being able to assess that and I want to continue in that tradition and our faculty, um, our staff, our educators um, are very good, provide very good um, uh, leadership and direction in those realms. So as we need to add programs, they look at the world where we're headed and they say, we need this new program or this field has evolved in this way and therefore our curricula need to evolve in these ways also. So we see that constant um, improvement, updating of curricula across the college, across our programs happening, adding new programs and figuring out which programs really. Well, I mean, you know, also there also there's, there's enrollment. Exactly, exactly. People don't sign up for a class. Right, right. After so much time that you start to ask yourself, is there a demand on the student side or on the job side? It's, if there's nothing that we can do to really see, uh, to really increase the enrollment, perhaps there isn't a demand and the program goes into dormancy. Right. Well, and I often think about the skill side because I know that from when I was um, when I first started teaching at Greenfield High School, we were using mini DV tapes, for instance. And we were using software that was a version that was that many years Old, prior. Old, yeah. So teaching the software itself is really not that important. Right. Because it's going to change. That's right. It's critical thinking. Um, and, and also, and also, it's to it's also teaching our students about lifelong learning. Right. Jobs are changing very rapidly. In the age of the fourth industrial revolution, what we're seeing is a convergence of talent, skills, and industries. So there's less of that discrete separation between uh, what a computer scientist does versus what somebody else has done does, and it's not nothing exists in a vacuum anymore. Right. So all kinds of fields are being integrated. So giving our students the 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 knowledge to be able to evolve as their fields evolve, um, we expect them to have about a dozen jobs by the time they retire. The idea of you get out of high school and you go work at a factory and you work there until you retire and you have a defined benefit plan mm -hmm. and you're somehow just take, you know, you're going to be, able, that doesn't exist. No, the world has changed and we change with it. And of course with robotics, people talk about outsourcing. We lose mm -hmm. more jobs to robotics than we do absolutely. outsourcing. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and we know one of the things that we know is that the lowest, um, the lowest paid jobs that require the lowest level of skills are going to be replaced and are being replaced at a very fast rate. So when we prepare students, we want to be sure that we are preparing them also um, to be able to create knowledge, but also to be able to work and also to be able to work in fields where there is going to be a job in the next five years and they can continue to evolve. What good is it to equip students with um, technical jobs, especially for which the demand is waning? I suppose my concern is that, you know, you, there are some people, for instance, I'm a creative type. Mm -hmm. So I could sit down and you could say, I need so many ideas, give me 10 ideas on, and I can come up with 10 ideas. That's easy for me because that's where, there are some people that they don't think that way. Mm -hmm. And what I'm concerned about is that based upon how our, each individual's brain is wired, some people simply may, may not be able to adapt to that changing, you know, the types of jobs that they are capable of doing, that they're sort of, um, the types of jobs that, that give them satisfaction mm -hmm. and that they're adept at, mm -hmm. that bring them meaning, mm -hmm. help society, mm -hmm. are not the jobs that are gonna be available. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that's a greater issue than yeah. GCC can yeah. solve. Yeah. But we as a society have to determine, well, you know, what is the value of a human life? What is the dignity that we have in a human mm -hmm. life? How can we make it so that every, anyone that wants to work mm -hmm. can have work that is meaningful, yeah. even though there's yeah. artificial intelligences that are gonna take away a lot of jobs. Yeah. The robotics have already taken away a lot of jobs. So we see that with the adult learners okay. who have had careers and maybe their jobs were, went offshore or they went somewhere else in the country or their jobs stopped to exist. So they come back to us and what we do with them is counseling, career counseling, mm -hmm. and asking what do you enjoy, what gives you fulfillment, what gives you satisfaction, and then more on the practical side, how much do you need to make? Right. What does your lifestyle require? 
And those can be hard conversations. If you imagine you're a head of household and suddenly you can't provide for your family, so talking about the dignity of work, right. I know if I couldn't work, um, I would feel like my ability to my ability to provide for my family defines me. Right. And if I can't have that, you, you take away who I am, part of my identity, you take away a big part of my identity. So to have these conversations from an empathetic perspective to say, I understand what it's like. Mm -hmm. um, I may not have walked in your shoes, but I am sympathetic to what you're going through. And let's talk about where you derive satisfaction from. Right. What excites you? What are your skills? What do you want to do? And then to help to counsel people into careers um, that will give them joy and also be able to um, allow them to meet the needs of their families and for themselves. So if there is someone at home that's tuning in and they're going, oh, well, I really like this woman and you know, I I want to gain some new skills. What do, what do they do? Do they just call GCC and someone will answer the phone and help them out? Absolutely. I would say they can call our admissions department. They can also call our workforce development department. And that's where we look at skills. And we, if you're not um, someone who's going to be going for a full two-year college degree, we have our downtown campus, mm -hmm. which is just a stone's throw away, right. um, stone's throw from here. And you can get a certificate in a program that does not require um, two years of study. So right. the associate degree really is the first two years of the bachelor's degree, of the undergraduate degree. Right, and those credits are have been shown to be totally transferable, certainly to UMass. Yes, yes, and our students do very well at UMass. Right. Their performance is at par and in some areas um, may even exceed um, that UMass That doesn't students. surprise me. When I went to UMass, I learned a lot about partying. <laughs> and I, I actually think, I think there's a benefit to that because I don't know how you were in high school, but I was the kid, if I did go to a party, I would sit in the corner because I was too shy to talk to anybody. I was an outlier. I, I spent my parties with my books. I, okay. well. yeah, I was that kind of kid. But I will say to my colleague um, Swami's um, uh, uh, defense, UMass is no longer a party school. Right. Um, okay. There was a very nice article in UMass uh, in the uh, Globe magazine last week, and um, he's really done a lot with his faculty and staff to really elevate um, well, it's a lot uh, harder to get into yes. UMass now. Yes, yes. I mean, that was the only school I applied to. Well, I'll start at GCC. Well, that's what people yeah. should do. If yeah. they, I mean, I would yeah. recommend that. And as I'm yeah. glad my daughter wants to do that. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy about that. Certainly the art department, like I say, I've known for years, they have an outstanding scholarship to RISD every year. Yes. And I believe they have one to Parsons as well. Yes. So, I mean, that's, how many community colleges can say that? Absolutely. So... Our students are phenomenal. I mean, I, I am just impressed. And when I bring folks from Eastern Mass and elsewhere in the country um, to see the level of work and research that our students are engaged in, the caliber of the faculty who teach at the college um, and the work that they do nationally, internationally, in fact, um, we have a delegation of students and faculty right now who are in Guatemala, working in Guatemala. We have students who've done all kinds of um, research abroad and who bring that back here and then who go on and have wonderful careers and um, earn bachelor's, master's and doctorate degrees and themselves become leaders in their field. So we have a great legacy and I just want to say that I am very thankful for this community for really um, understanding and uh, education and, and, and investing in higher education. Well, it certainly seems that the Greenfield community or the Franklin County community, community supports GCC. Absolutely. They do an amazing job of yeah. raising money because there's never enough, apparently. Yes, yes, and we also serve Hampshire County. Okay. So our students come from primarily Franklin and Hampshire counties. Okay, we so, are the community so how college. are you different from Holyoke Community College? I mean, is there some, is there areas where they are known for they have a great culinary school or something. And yes. We, or, I mean, I don't know. Yes, yeah, so they have a great culinary school. I can't say that I know Holyoke sure. um, Community uh, College very well. Certainly my colleague, Dr. Christina Royal, is phenomenal. She's been doing a great job there. Um, my focus in the last six months really has been about what's great about GCC and spreading the gospel of GCC. And that's part of your job. And, and so, that's my job. <laughs> and, and, and so... So your undergraduate degree is in poli-sci, which I was interested in, but I found the Federalist Papers so boring, <laughs> and now I find them interesting. So, well, you were a party guy, you I said. I was a party. Well, I didn't, you know, actually, among all my friends, I was the most moderate of the party guys, which is why I graduated. <laughs> they mostly dropped out. But I did learn how to party, and I, and I think that... That's a great skill. It is a great skill. Yeah, was, social mean, skills, social communication. 
I swear. Hey, it helped you. Look at you now. Well, that's and that's the thing. Yeah. So when people say, oh, I can never be on TV, it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> anyone can do it. It's just a question of doing it. But that the fear keeps us from doing things. Right, right. And so combating fear, make, you know, spreading the love. Um, but I'm curious about this poli-sci. What, what interested you in poli-sci at such a young age? <sighs> So it's interesting. I mean, having grown up in Haiti during a lot of political unrest, and I was also very... Was Papa Do a baby doc? Baby doc was okay. president, and then we had a series of dictators, a series of coups, right. and then um, Aristide had just been elected right before I left. Um, and and so, that didn't go so well. Was no. he pushed out by us? Um, yes. <laughs> That's because the point. He was answer. democratically yeah. elected, but he yes. wasn't doing what we wanted. Yes. So Aristide was pushed out. So I had an interest in that, in social justice issues in general. Um, I was also fascinated by Russia mm. um, and the fall of the Soviet Union. I was right. very fascinated by that. Um, and then, yeah, and my, my father was very political. Um, so I became very political, and so I studied political science and minored in international relations, and then I got progressively, I guess, more quantitative. I developed an interest in, e in political economy, specifically, right. um, so studied economics, and then while studying economics, I realized that I had a deep interest in statistics and in predicting outcomes and understanding um, understanding outcomes and predicting outcomes, so my PhD is in um, statistics and measurement. So, um, so if we get into economics, basically, from my understanding of economics, and I, I took economics at UMass, I loved it, and I actually took, they used to offer it at Greenfield High School. It seems that with economics, it's about creating models that explain how the world works. So that's why you have GDP and GNP, or you have... All of it. All of it. <laughs> and, and so they say, oh, well, if you cut taxes, then that's going to give us so many savings because that's going to be so many jobs created that then pay for the, pay for the tax cut. Right. And, of course, we hear that every time, and it never happens. Well, correlation does not equal causation. I, you know, I think that's the major takeaway um, that people think if you do this thing. Of course, there's, there's cause and effect right. when it comes to certain variables, but usually most phenomena are not explained by a single variable. So right. multiple things have to be happening, and you also have mediating and moderating um, variables sure. that also impact that outcome. For instance, I mean, I know that Seattle raised their minimum wage, mm -hmm. and everybody said, oh, it's going to wreck Seattle, mm -hmm. and actually their economy's done better. But mm -hmm. it hasn't done better for everybody, because what happens is when economies improve a lot of times, the gentrification will push out people who can't afford to stay in their own homes. Right, right. So there's There are unintended, unintended outcomes also That's that we right. have. And also I would be curious to, to, to know whether there are policy um, that policies that may have also been introduced around the same time that affected the outcome. That's so right. again, it's lots of things. You can't say it was this one thing that caused that other thing. And yet that's, that's the narrative complex. that we're given. It's like, oh, yeah. the stock market is up. Well, that's because Trump's doing a great job. Oh, the stock market is down. Well, that's because the Democrats opposed this. Right. I mean, I mean of course, I'm <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, yeah. guess what side of the yeah, fence yeah. I'm on. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but it just seems so often it's so superficial, the reasons given. In fact, yeah. I don't even understand why on the news it says, oh, well, the stock market went up today on reports that this happened. It's like, well, people don't buy and sell stocks because, I mean, maybe some people well, do. Well, yeah, yeah, we, we think, I mean, there's some things that you can see there's a strong rec correlation that I you mean, can say, yeah. I mean, with the jobs yeah. report. But right, a lot of times, right. the market, if it's a strong jobs report, the market goes down because, oh, well, there may be inflation with wages. Yeah, right, 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 it's like, right. I, yeah. It's like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't <laughs> sometimes. If you believe, if you, I, I'm not a socialist, but I am a so, social democrat. That is, I think that as a society, we are measured by how well we provide for the least among us. And I don't see that happening right now. And when I hear these economic arguments that, oh, well, we got to just cut taxes for the rich because we have to give them motivation to work harder or something, but given a paid cut to the someone who doesn't make much money, I mean, given a pay raise to someone who doesn't make much money, that doesn't work the same way? So I, I would say it's not an economic argument. Okay. I think it's a, it's, it's a deeply ideologically embedded economic argument. Okay. So I'd it's like to loaded, qualify that. It's this, yeah. it's loaded, it is, yeah. I get that. Yeah. It's not fair of me to throw that Yeah, no, no, but it, it is an economic, it's just a deeply ideologically right. so driven. So how do you get away from the ideological side where you're able to measure it in a way that actually makes sense because as you're saying there are all these variables and you don't always know what is really 
affecting what? Right. Because when, what I was getting to with the Seattle thing, let's say that we have the minimum wages going up because of the, the different states raised them. Mm -hmm. And then that helps the economy. Mm -hmm. Well, then, well, the economy's doing better because Trump's the president. Well, well, actually, it's because <laughs> the minimum wage went up in all these areas and they're doing better and that's being reflective in the general economy. I just... <laughs> I sh I'm sorry to get off tap, but we're supposed to be talking about GCC. <laughs> but when, you know, you say, oh, poly, poly sci, uh, economics, uh, I'm going to just like, pull on all these threads. I'm enjoying this. Okay. I'm absolutely enjoying this. So I'm gonna and, you know, and this is great because those are the kinds of discussions that also happen on campus. So, and we want to be very welcoming to students who have a range of ideological perspectives. Right. Um, so not just the left, not just the right, but to be able to hear each other out and to say, I may not agree with you, but I can see your value. I can understand the logic behind your argument. Right. And that is part of the purpose of higher education. Uh, but does that kind of um, uh, 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 discussion help you to make um, uh, a better piece of a product or help you to understand where someone else may be coming from who may be on the same manufacturing floor with you. Mm -hmm. um, the ability to have that conversation with them and not get heated, mm -hmm. that's something that we like. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe and maybe we are making the widgets, right? right? Because we have a very strong manufacturing program. Maybe we are making the widgets for that person. And, and just because you are making that widget also doesn't mean that you cannot have that conversation. So mm -hmm. to understand how the liberal arts and I don't mean liberal in Isn't an liberal, ideologi right. uh, ideological sense, but really to look at a broad way of um, uh, education, a very broad view, a liberal view of education um, where different things are included. It's important for people to have those skills that we don't segment folks and say, um, because you have in this interest, you're going into this line of work. This is, this is all you need to know education-wise, and we're going to cre now create classes of who needs to know what. So one of the things that we're also doing at GCC right now that is new is to have much deeper integration of liberal arts, even if out in our workforce development training. And part of that is also influenced by our conversations with manufacturers. So uh, a recent visit that I did to um, uh, a Decker manufacturing plant that's um, about a mile and a half away from here, um, maybe two miles. Uh, one of the things that they said is we need people who have a variety of skills. So if we're not making a component or part um, for our suppliers, that um, we can, that person can also uh, take care of the books for us or can put in an order or can do so. Uh, what we're seeing is that our graduates need to have a wider range mm -hmm. of skills and knowledge to be effective. And I think that's a good thing for us as a society. Absolutely. Um, our, can you believe it's already, the time's already passed by? I know, it's so it quickly. Just, it just flies by. Well, the thing is, you have a nice facility at GCC. We do. And it's a beautiful campus. It's a beautiful, it is, it, though it, I don't know how handicap accessible it is. We are absolutely handicap so accessible. It seems like a lot of stairs. But we also have a lot of handicap uh, uh, entrances. Okay, well, yeah, I, and be access I believe points. that. Yes. I just know that when I go. I was, if you I like come on a wheelchair or if you come on crutches or if you are any other way physically um, uh, impacted, trust me, you will be accommodated. Right. And we're very proud of that. All right. I'm so happy to meet you. Oh, this very is, nice to you see so you much again. And have fun. I'm having fun. All right. I hope that's evident. Yes, well, I, I believe so, but, but, but anyway, I'm, I'm Drew Hutchison. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining our conversation. This is Local Bias, show number 180. All right. So it's, the time is flying by. Take care. Mm -hmm.